stumbling towards some kind of solution to these these problems. But um, it's going to be a few months before we really have a good feel of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me make my announcements. Uh, we'll be starting the show in uh, in a little bit, a minute thirty. So I better go fast. Uh, we want we want to thank all our media partners who are streaming the show tonight. AwardsAuto.com, DC Auto Geek, and Driven Mavens. Uh, want to thank the volunteers in the sh chat room, Mud Monster, Scotty in Cleveland, and DC Auto Geek. Remember, folks, we got Carl Ludvigson coming on. We'd love to get your questions for him and anything else we talk about tonight. Go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash after hours if you want to get your questions into us. Shoot us an email, send it to viewer mail at autolinedetroit.tv or give us a call. The number again, as I announce every week, 1-620-288-6546. Uh, we'll be posting the video of this show shortly after the show. You can subscribe to it at the iTunes store uh, for the podcast version, that is. Just look for Autoline After Hours. It's free. It'll be available late tomorrow afternoon. You can always get our shows, including this one, on your smartphone or BlackBerry via Stitcher. Uh, just go to our website, autoline.tv, click on the Stitcher logo. You'll find it there on the home page. It'll walk you through the paces, and we'll get going here momentarily. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion, and by Chevrolet, Chevy runs deep. Peter. John. We're here, man. Again. Again. Again and again. <laughs> and again and again. So uh, lots to talk about today. Uh, we should let everybody know that in about 10 minutes or so, Carl Ludvigsen author, journalist, designer, uh, public relations guy, a whole bunch of other things uh, will be joining us from London. Well, not really London, but we'll call it London. That's close enough. Over there. <laughs> right. So what's hit you this week? What do you, what's really stood out for you, Peter? Well, let's see. Uh, my com was about auto show aftermath, and uh, that seemed to piss a whole new bunch of people off. <laughs> And why? Explain why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, I, I just was kind of uh, amazed that so many people weigh in on, on the auto show who weren't actually there to see the vehicles in person, you know. Um, the Fusion seems to have cut through and people agree that that looks pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The Lincoln seems to be getting a lot of uh, grief again from people who haven't seen it in person and right. I, I don't I, I kind of don't quite understand and everyone is uh, weighing in on the Lincoln on that one concept and this is a long road I mean Ford executives know this is a decade-long proposition so right. this is just the first volley and it's the tip of the iceberg of a whole a monumental uh, push within Ford to, mm -hmm. to to take, revive Lincoln and get it going again. So, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot going on this week in, in regard to the after show, you know, after show, uh, aftermath. Yeah, uh, no, I heard uh, some negative feedback on, on the Ford MKZ. And you know, we've been talking it up for months here, but I agree with you as we've talked about before. You gotta see these things out on the road in yeah. the natural light with other cars around them and then you'll get a much better view of what the car is really about. Yeah, and uh, Ford's paying executive bonuses again. That just came out, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, well, you know, in another couple of weeks they'll report their financial earnings for last year. And it's going to be a big number. I mean, a big number. So, yeah, they ought to be getting bonuses. Why not? Of yeah. course. They earned it. So what's on your mind? Well, well, the thing that I thought was interesting is the National Academy of Sciences came out yesterday and said, uh, you know all those problems Toyota had with sudden unintended acceleration? It was driver error. And... Uh, 
you know, we've been saying that all along here. And that now some people have said, oh, well, there's these electronic gremlins. And even the National Academy said, yeah, there, there is some weird stuff that happens with electronics. In fact, the specific term that they refer to it as tin whiskers. And they're like these <laughs> super microscopic things that can happen in electronics. But as we pointed out with unintended acceleration, two things. Number one, it overwhelmingly occurs with older drivers. And I know this is not PC to say, but older women drivers especially. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is unintended acceleration as a problem has been around for decades. It you know, affected Audi well before there was ever electronic throttle control. In fact, it even precedes any electronics in cars whatsoever. So. And as we said, there was never any report of it with a manual transmission. Gee, right. how does that work? <laughs> right. Yeah, so they just right. confirm what we had already known, but they have to beat it to death and then. Well, you know, it's, it's the professional car sewers, you know, the people who make a living out of going around suing car companies who absolutely need to have some sort of mysterious gremlin so that they can go after the automakers. And look, I'm, I'm not against going after automakers when they, they cause problems, because yeah. they do. They make mistakes. Sure. They have stuff that's not well built or not well designed. But this unintended acceleration stuff is just so bogus. And I really learned so much about it back when it hit Audi in 1987. In fact, I stopped watching 60 Minutes, the television program, because they did such a hack job on Audi and never apologized for it, never, never rescinded anything that they said that was so bogus. But yeah. Anyway, I thought that was rather interesting. Yes, I thought that was interesting. I thought it was interesting, too, that the head of Porsche said, uh, they aren't going to jump into this smaller sports car jointly developed with Audi and Volkswagen, that they're going to sort of take a break from that and wait, wait that out. And I was just like, wow, that was really good. Because, you know, Porsche has sort of been operating under the equation, more models equals more money. But I, you know, I have to applaud them for saying, you know what, we're, we're going to, we're going to pull, pull back from that. Because, I'm sorry, but I don't like the words jointly developed with Audi and Volkswagen and the word Porsche in the same sentence. I mean, it's if Porsche is going to survive as this entity, if they're going to sell Cayennes and Panameras in order to, to build the cool stuff, then I think it's pretty visionary on the head of Porsche's part to say, you know, we're going to give that a rest. We're not going to dive into that. So in fact, that, when we get uh, Carl Ludvigsen in, we're going to have to ask him about it because he wrote what I think is the definitive book on Porsche. Well, my favorite, the, the book that probably did more to get me excited about, you know, the possibility of writing about cars was excellence, was expected, of the, the Porsche story, mm -hmm. which is my favorite car book of all time, so. Yeah, well, we'll bring this up again when we yeah. get him on. One other thing I wanted to talk about, because I thought that this was uh, extraordinary, at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, Audi introduced a new technology called Traffic Jam Assist. So you know about uh, cruise control and you know about adaptive cruise control. Well, this is the next step where the car not only speeds up and slows down automatically, it also does the steering. So it'll steer around pedestrians or other cars that are conked out on the freeway. And uh, I think that is mind-blowing because typically when Audi shows anything, 18, 24 months later, it's in production. So. Yeah, you know, I, I, well, you're, you're big on this. So I am. These, you know, eventually we'll, we'll pull into the city limits of urban centers and, and flip a switch and, and be guided into our parking space. Right. And, you know, that's cool. <laughs> I, guess. <laughs> I know you don't like it, but I, I think it's the next big thing in the automotive industry because I think so many people, whether they're disabled or elderly or, or very young, I mean, you know, like kids, I don't mean like teenage kids, I mean even younger than that, grade school, will be able to use an automobile. Yeah. That, that's why I think it's going to be a, a huge thing. I can see it in urban centers just to, to relieve the traffic, the congestion, the the uh, accordion effect and all that. I mean, it could be kind of freaky if everyone's going 65, 70 miles an hour and doing all this stuff. And yeah. Well, th the stuff that Audi is, this traffic jam assist technology, 
will be designed to work only at speeds up to 60 kilometers an hour, which is like 37, 38 miles an hour, something like that. So, uh, and yeah, supposedly you're only supposed to use it in stop and go traffic jam kind of situations. Yeah. But, yeah. well, hey, uh, why, why don't we take a, a quick commercial break and then why don't we get uh, Carl Ludvigson in here? Okay, cool. Ben, let's take the first commercial break. <laughs> Well, Carl Ludvigson, time to join, have you join us here on AutoLine After Hours, and it's so good to see you staying up past midnight in England <laughs> to be with us right now. It's a pleasure to be with you. I don't mind at all. It's really great. <laughs> so, Carl, how should we describe you, just so in case anybody out there listening doesn't know who you are, what are you? <laughs> well, I spent about, uh, I don't know, more than a decade with uh, General Motors and uh, Fiat Motors of North America and uh, a Ford of Europe. So I've, I've worked in the industry over the years and uh, I've edited car magazines. I've been a freelance writer for years working on all kinds of projects and I spent 15 years here in London uh, running a motor industry management consultancy, uh, dealing with problems of car makers, uh, accessory makers, uh, government bodies, uh, European Union, et cetera, et cetera, which was very, very interesting. So I guess I've kind of tried to cover the waterfront. And, and done so pretty well, too. And Carl, you, uh, you knew my dad pretty well because you were with GMPR when my dad was there, correct? Peter, I certainly did. Yeah. I was very, very proud and pleased to be uh, working for Tony. Uh, it was a great, great time for General Motors uh, PR in those days. Yeah, uh, that, think, that. Well, we had we had a lot to work with. We we had a great company, and all we really had to do was portray it as it was. Although, of course, when I think about it, we uh, we got into the when I was there, the Ralph Nader uh, period was beginning. Uh, so a number of different things were going on that uh, Corvair was in trouble. Uh, so we had, we had a few things to deal with and I, uh, some we dealt with pretty well, others perhaps not so well. Yeah, actually it's funny you mentioned that. We were just talking about that, um, that when um, unbeknownst to my dad who was in charge of General Motors PR at the time, uh, an investiga uh, investigators were hired in Washington to tail Nader. And I remember my dad telling me that the meeting where they discovered that this investigate the investigators were hired by uh, someone on the GM legal staff, unbeknownst unbeknownst to my dad, that was a very tense meeting. And then, of course, that basically changed the shape of the automobile industry for good because it made Ralph Nader and it created the the push for the the safety. Uh, Agency. Peter, it did, it did, and we, uh, in, in our department, uh, uh, Press Relations, uh, Tom Groen and company, we did try, uh, Carlton Breckler was active in it, we tried to alert management to the importance of uh, unsafe at any speed. Uh, we, we did our darndest to alert the company to the fact that this was not just another little thing that was going to blow over. Uh, I don't think we quite got the message across, but you know, you can only try as, as hard as you can, really. And uh, yeah, in fact, I, I want to weigh in because sure. I, I told Peter because we were talking about this before we started the show uh, that I don't think that story's ever come out. Uh, yes, we know, of course, that GM hired these detectives to follow Rolf Nader, but I don't think the inside story of what was going on inside mm -hmm. GM and and what Peter's saying here, I think, is is explosive that the head of public relations at General Motors was unaware that this was taking place and oh, other no. high-level members of management were unaware of it. Yeah, the only... No, they, the, were, they were completely unaware. The, this, this was, uh, uh, as, as Peter said, action taken by a lady on the, um, on the uh, legal staff uh, several levels down on her own initiative to say, oh gosh, we really ought to find out a little more about this guy, Nader, and see if you know what he's up to but her and her uh, <laughs> her big boss knew about it and didn't tell anyone uh, Aloysius Powers oh yeah and knew about it and then and my dad told me about that meeting uh, one morning when I guess I don't know you might have heard but uh, from what I understood the Washington Post called or 
somebody from the Washington Post called my dad directly and said, are you aware of this? And, All right, okay. And, so, he's, and uh, he said, yeah. uh, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, he initially, of course, denied it because he, you know, it was, he couldn't imagine this was going on. And then, of course, there was a tense meeting where it came out. Uh, like you said, this, you know, legal staff took it upon themselves, didn't tell anyone. Yep. And it created Ralph Nader. And then my dad was the one who had to tell Jim Roach that you have to go to Washington to this hearing and publicly apologize. Yeah, that was uh, just uh, excruciating. And there, there, there was no finer gentleman in the motor industry at any time than Jim Roach. I mean, he really was uh, yeah. a sincere and uh, wonderfully well-meaning person in every respect. So for him to have to be put in that position was just uh, appalling. And he was what, chairman of the company at the time? Oh yes, yes yeah. he sure was. Right. Yeah, uh, Jim Roach was a, was a very good guy and you're exactly right, very humble, unassuming guy, you know. And See, I, you know, here we are, you know, half a century later and the story's coming out here on Autoline After Hours tonight. <laughs> I think General Motors would have been seen in a much better light if the public had been aware that, hey, th this was like rogue executives operating on their own to hire these dicks to tail Ray Nader. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but there is just a mini story here, which is that when I was at Sports Cars Illustrated, I did the launch road test on the Corvair, and I said the Corvair is at, at, at heart a profoundly oversteering car. You know, the, the rear end wants to get ahead of the front end. Uh, and I said that in print. And um, by the time all of this uh, came out, of course, and uh, the Nader era was upon us, uh, there I was working at General Motors in public relations. <laughs> and the, the legal guys were petrified that somehow, uh, you know, somebody on the other side would figure this out, that uh, they had me working uh, at GM. But luckily, that nobody ever made that connection. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't know if a lot of the viewers have uh, seen the book or heard about the book, but Carl, your uh, your book on Porsche, the definitive book on Porsche, excellence was expected, really charged me and, and uh, inspired me to, you know, do something about writing about cars. And uh, I think you've, how many times have you updated it? Well, I think I think we've updated Excellence now three times, going on four. It's it's uh, valid up to 2008, I think, at the moment, and we're getting ready to do another update. <laughs> it's now about a million words, three volumes, uh, 1,600 pages. So uh, you get your money's worth with Excellence as expected. <laughs> yeah. So if any of your listeners or viewers out there have have never checked it out, it's fabulous. But and say I, the name again. Excellence was expected. The story of uh, is there a subtitle to it? I, I don't. No, it's just Porsche. Excellence was expected. Yeah, yeah and uh, the, uh, my favorite was the first volume because uh, uh, you know it's just fascinating, and uh, it took us through what year the first one. Well, a very, in 1948, when they created the first uh, Type 356, and, and uh, just a little word to my fans out there, I've got a new book coming out, Porsche, um, The Origin of the Species, and for the first time we really have gone into what actually happened in the very, very early days, how and why the 356 came out like it did, uh, the role of the Swiss uh, entrepreneurs who backed the project, uh, we, uh, the involvement of Chisitalia, how that influenced the 356. Cool. So we've got a heck of a story coming in the spring, I think, from uh, Bentley Publishers. Fantastic. When, uh, what year did the first excellence, what year did it go up to? 19, well, it went up, well, we published it in 1978. So uh, right up to about that time. That was the original, original book. But, uh, you know, 800, I, yeah, I love the uh, my favorite parts of the book because one of my favorite all time race cars was the 908. Mm -hmm. uh, Mine was the 917. Yeah, the 908 Spider and and you know oh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, uh, Piac was uh, instrumental in that car. Is that correct? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Ferdinand Piech was, was a brilliant uh, head engineer of, uh, of uh, the technical side at Porsche. Uh, Helmut Bott was his deputy. In between them, they uh, did some astounding things. Beryllium, brake discs, I mean, you name it. <laughs> they, they had technology uh, uh, up the gazoo. <laughs> what, what do you make of Porsche these days? And you, you must have heard uh, Peter and I talking earlier about uh, passing on doing a, a, a shared sports car with Volkswagen and Audi. I, I'm pretty impressed with what Porsche is doing. Uh, they are finding ways to work more economically um, so that their cars can be sold profitably, which they are. Um, and and I was, you know, they emphasize these days um, passion and uh, excitement rather than technology, uh, which is a way to appeal to a much broader audience. But to their great credit, the cars are still tremendous to drive. Uh, so they, the engineers at Weissach are not letting down the side. They're clearly defending the characteristic of Porsche, which is a, the ultimate driver's car, in my opinion, um, and producing, you know, really exciting cars to drive and enjoyable cars to drive. Uh, so I'm, I'm impressed with the way they've managed to, uh, to balance the uh, need to economize and share parts within their uh, activity. As, as Peter said, they don't want to uh, go outside any more than they have to. Obviously, with the uh, Cayenne, they did uh, share some things with Volkswagen. That's worked out pretty well. Um, they couldn't have done it otherwise. Uh, but generally, they found ways to share components within the company and among a, a wide range of models, which is uh, pretty clever. Very, very in ingenious stuff. So, darn good. They're doing a good job. I think it'll get better, too, because they're growing like crazy in China. And in fact, I know they've got an internal goal of doubling sales, uh, not necessarily just in China, but you know, globally. In, in, globally, exactly right. So as profitable and successful as they are right now, it could double within this decade. That would be a big ask, but uh, uh, half again, maybe, uh, you know, by mid-decade, half again, probably, and yes, end of decade, they could double, no question. Or close to it. Right? And, and to your point, Carl, about Porsche, you know, they're pretty ingenious in what they do, and the, the new 911 um, has a seven-speed manual gearbox that's uh, basically a modification of the seven-speed PDK. And yeah. um, I think that's, I mean, that's pretty radical stuff right there. And so they're still on their game. Uh, I agree 100% to Peter. They are very much on their game. Um, they, they've they got to balance the relationship with um, with Volkswagen, of course. And um, the the position there is that the uh, merger, the full merger of the companies, isn't happening. Uh, there have been some legal challenges to uh, the idea of a merger between uh, the two companies, which was on the agenda. Technically, they should have done it already, but it's been put off now for several years because uh, there are a number of legal issues to be uh, overcome, and uh, they they said publicly, no, we're not going to be doing it right away. But Carl, don't you think that's more of a, a legal issue and that when it comes to actual, the, the, the hardware end of the business, there is massive cooperation with Volkswagen Group and Porsche. And it's the Porsche holding company that's got these legal issues. Yes, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's going to uh, affect uh, the actual operation. I think it does, uh, you know, the, 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 the tragedy of, of what happened with Porsche uh, is that it did lose its independence. I mean, it, and, and Ferry Porsche fought like tooth and nail for decades to maintain Porsche's independence in spite of many attempts by Volkswagen to undermine it. And of course, uh, Vita King and his hubris uh, managed to create a situation where a Porsche lost its independence, and that uh, that was a catastrophe. Uh, it hasn't worked out badly for the family. The uh, PX and Porsches are doing very well out of it all, thank you. <laughs> Wolfgang Porsche is head of the supervisory board at uh, Porsche. So 
Yeah, the family is still very much involved, but um, they, they want to keep their distance as much as they can. And the fact that a full merger hasn't happened at least allows them a modicum of uh, independence. Mm -hmm. So, Carl, over here stateside, we're all wondering what's going on with Europe and the European industry especially. And uh, there's more talk these days, literally just in the last couple of weeks, of more mergers taking place there, more consolidation. We had that uh, call uh, to arms from uh, Sergio Marchionne uh, during the show. <clears throat> he said uh, that he feels that we really need consolidation, especially in Europe, and except for um, uh, Volkswagen, we don't have a big European car company. They're all medium-sized uh, auto companies, of course, Porsche, uh, excuse me, of course, Opel and uh, Ford are integrated with their American parents, but uh, um, we, we really could do with some additional consolidation. And the, the main wild cards, if you will, are the two French companies, Renault and uh, Peugeot Citroën. Um, and, but don't you think I, Renault I, is really taken care of now that it's tied up with uh, Nissan, or now that it essentially acquired Nissan? Yes, yes, I think I think that's right. I think, uh, uh, John, for that reason, uh, Renault's probably not a, uh, a candidate for consolidation right now. There's still a, a small uh, golden share owned by the French government. Uh, that complicates uh, things. Uh, so PSA is the one that could play a, play a role maybe in a, in a consolidation in, uh, in Europe. Uh, there is already some uh, cooperation between PSA and uh, Fiat in uh, commercial vehicles. They share a number of projects, uh, light, light commercials and so on. So uh, I, think, I think that's kind of the way Mr. Marchioni is probably, uh, probably thinking. By the way, speaking of that, you... You know, you have the new Dodge uh, Dart at the show, mm -hmm. which is based on a uh, uh, Alfa Romeo chassis. It looks pretty good, actually. Um, and we, in the, here in the UK, we have, believe it or not, the Chrysler Delta and Ypsilon. Now, you may not be aware <laughs> that these are being sold in Britain, um, but they're launches, aren't they? I mean, they're the launch of Ypsilon and Delta. And they've been launched through the Chrysler uh, dealer organization in the UK. And, and I, uh, so far, people are kind of looking around in a bemused manner, trying to figure out what to make of this uh, initiative. Um, Lancia, of course, uh, since rust problems uh, in the 1980s, has, has uh, had a black mark against it in the British, uh, British market. So uh, this is a way of sneaking some launches in under the uh, Chrysler nameplate, but it's, uh, it's hard to tell whether it's going to work out. Yeah, in fact, uh, we've got Deltas running around on the streets of Detroit, where our new studio is here. Just up the road is a, a big TRW electronics plant, uh, and there's a, a Lancia Delta parked in the parking lot there every day. So clearly, they must have some contract to help homologate it for American emission or fuel economy standards or something like that. But uh, yeah, the Delta is coming to the American market. Yeah, yeah, that's strange. Little, little odd looking car. You, you, you know it when you see it, which is, which is good. Nothing <laughs> right, wrong with that. Right. You want to be visible. But you're right. Con <clears throat> consolidation is a theme, and and uh, another theme, of course, is uh, GM's uh, struggle to get profitable. Um, they're just uh, not profitable, uh, and of, of course. You know, in recent history, GM tried to sell its European operations, changed its mind, said, okay, we'll hang on to it. Instead, we're going to make a go of it. Uh, we're not going to sell it to Frank Stronach and Magna. And everything. We're going we're gonna, to gonna press on, see what we can do. And uh, so far, they're, they're still struggling. The cars are good. But uh, they don't really have a senior model that rakes in the big bucks, you know, something with a big profit margin. They're, they're, they're stuck dealing in the, in the tough segments, really, where, where pricing is uh, crucial. So one of the things they're talking about right now is trying to bring um, some production from Korea back to Europe. 
uh, and be making in uh, the European plants some of the cars that are assembled in uh, in Korea. So they could be making Chevrolets, for example. Uh, you know, I was astounded to realize that a quarter of GM's production comes from Korea. I mean, mm -hmm. crikey, <laughs> I hadn't realized that. Uh, so I can, and, and, and people are saying, gee, we're selling a lot of these Chevrolets in Europe now. Um, maybe we ought to be making some of them there. And of course, Opel's got, uh, and Vauxhall, got some plants that have spare capacity. And if you can utilize the capacity better, you can, uh, you can uh, maybe have a, a hope of making some money. So that's a, that's, a, that's a theme. And GM is just opening discussions with the... Uh, the unions in Korea right now, and of course, uh, the Korean unions are not pushovers. <laughs> no, they're like as Japan. militant as IG Metal. <laughs> oh no, it's, maybe uh, more militant. <laughs> they might be the most militant unions in the world. The ones they, in South they're, Korea. They're, they're serious. They can shut you down. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that uh, how that plays out. But that is a, that is a, a big uh, preoccupation right now to see if they can uh, shift some production to help the. Uh, the rentability of the uh, European plants. Well, of course, you know, I, I've always said that the problem in fixing Opal is not getting hard-nosed business managers in there making tough decisions. They've had people trying to do that. It's that this is a political minefield that to close plants and lay off people in Europe, particularly in Germany, is a political problem, not necessarily a management problem. And John, you couldn't be more right. Um, they did succeed in closing uh, the plant at uh, Antwerp, GM Continental. I mean, it was a struggle, but they did. You, you know, you can do it in Europe, but you've, you've got a, 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 a ritual to follow. You have to start with certain assumptions. You have to tell the unions. You've got a long, long process of, uh, of information and uh, and uh, acquiescence and so on. You've got to tick a lot of boxes in order to do it uh, properly. Of course, uh, Antwerp, Belgium, uh, you know, it's very close to the EU and Brussels, and so it's a very sensitive uh, area. But they 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 did uh, they did manage it. Uh, so they are they are trying to to uh, uh, consolidate some plants if they if they possibly can. Jumping topics here completely, Carl. We had Jim Hall in here last week on the show, and he said one of his fondest memories of all time is you driving him around London. I think he said around Hyde Park in a Lancia Stratos. And he said, be sure to ask Carl if he still has the Stratos. <laughs> I, I no longer have the Stratos. It was, <laughs> it was terrific. I, another guy you might want to talk to is Herb Fischel, uh, you know, the former GM head of performance. Uh, I, I, I drove Herb back to his hotel in the Stratos through the through the streets of London, and he, he st still can't stop talking about it. <laughs> it. It was a fabulous car. Um, it was a fabulous car, and I enjoyed it for a long time. But when I went out from London on one of the motorways um, in it, um, and I was passed by a, uh, an, a Ford Escort Turbo with four people in it, I thought, well, okay, <laughs> it was good for a while, <laughs> but it's time to move on. <laughs> so uh, I thought it, 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 it really was tremendous. I enjoyed driving it uh, a lot. Um, yeah, it was a great, great machine. And for our uh, viewers and listeners out there, Carl, explain the Stratus was this magnificent short wheelbase mid-engine, lightweight vehicle yeah. that was developed primarily for rallying, is that correct? It was, uh, Peter. It was developed uh, specifically for rallying um, and, and from scratch uh, by uh, Bertoni working with Lancia, with the Lancia uh, motorsports people, Serge, uh, 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 Cesare Fiorio and his team. Um, and uh, Lancia itself really had no idea what to do uh, about the Stratos. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, you know, it was something that, that Fiorio wanted, and he, he managed to, to get it organized and get it built. Uh, and it was styled by Gandini. It's a little, little wedge-type machine with a windscreen like a jet fighter. Yeah, it was be uh, it's a beautiful uh, And it car. had, there was not any single part of the car that, 
didn't have to be there. <laughs> there was nothing extra on the Stratos. It was absolutely paired to the essentials and uh, a terrific uh, machine to drive. And when I joined Fiat Motors of North America in 1978, uh, my first priority was to get my hands on a Stratos. <laughs> I, I thought, hmm, I must be, there must still be, you know, they were built and sold in the early 70s, and I thought there must still be some around that I could get, get my hands on. And uh, Lancia did come up with one. They, they, they had one that was used for show and display, and they were finished with it. So uh, that's how I got my hands on one. It, it was uh, fabulous. And it had uh, it had Ferrari power, and it was uh, how much did it weigh? Like eighteen hundred pounds? Or I don't. I know less than that. I think it uh. was. Uh, yeah, it had the Ferrari Dino V6 in it. That's right, right uh, Peter. No, it was just just enough. And I, I, oh, it was a great, great little car. I'm very, very pleased to have had it. Well, you know, I've got a fond spot in my heart for that Stratos too, because little known story in 1971, and I, I think 1970 as well. The World Rally Championship every year came to, or those two years, came to Michigan because there was a rally in the Upper Peninsula of the state called the Press On Regardless Rally that for a few years there was an FIA event. Was an FIA yeah. event, and you could earn points for the World Rally Championship. So to get publicity for it, they held uh, the first stage on Belle Isle in Detroit. Oh, I remember that. And then after they did the first stage, they all hop on I-75 and go up into the Upper Peninsula. But I went down to Belle Isle to see the first stage of the rally, and the Lancia team was there. And boy, I can still see it in my mind right now of, uh, there's a couple of bridges on the island, not leading to the island, but yeah. on the island itself that are, are sort of humps. And these things were getting airborne like I've never seen a car get in the air. And I'm a kid in high school at the time, man, and I'm just like eating this stuff up. And I have never forgotten the Lancia Stratos because of that. It was it was uh, terrific, it, it, as you said, custom built for rallying. That was the uh, that was, so it was extremely agile, light, good traction, um, great great vision, great visibility. Uh, had it had it all really. There was an attempt recently to create a modern, create and market a, a modern sort of updated Stratos. It was based on a Ferrari chassis, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I've, what I've heard lately is that uh, it's not uh, happening. There, uh, there are uh, companies in the UK that make very, very uh, acceptable replica Stratos cars right at the moment. So uh, you know, if you if you still itch for one, they can. You can have a pretty darn good facsimile. <laughs> Carl, anything that you own now or wish you did own that really stand out? <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm, I have a 1935 uh, French uh, Talbot uh, sports saloon, which we've just recently acquired, and we have a, a post-war Riley uh, sports car, two-seater Riley sports car, so that's keeping us pretty busy at the moment. Uh, no, nothing, and, and my, my runaround car is an Audi TT, and uh, I, I just love that car. It's a, just a terrific machine, just great for what we need it for over here. Yeah. Couldn't be better. To another commercial break. Yeah, why don't we uh, take another uh, commercial break here, and then uh, we can chat a bit and get into rapid fire. But Ben, let's give a shout out to our friends at who do we have now? Chevrolet, I think. It was more than a car to him. It really was his baby. Oh no. That's my old Chevy. Dear God. So, Carl, uh, what do you uh, see from afar over here? What do you like in our uh, in the U.S. Uh, well, I, car I, I companies look, right, right yeah, now? Yeah, I had a look at what uh, what was happening at the show, um, and and I I agree with you that the fusion. Uh, looks like the real deal. I mean, I think they 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 sweated the details on that car uh, in a way that you don't often see from uh, the American makers. That's that's where that's where the Americans tend to fall down. They say, okay, that's good enough. You know, <laughs> yeah. go go with that. 
Uh, but in the case of the fusion, clearly they they decided they wanted it to be good, all good, and it is all good as far as I can tell. And and we're quite excited over here because it's the uh, the Mondeo of the future for right. Europe. Right. The only um, apprehension that people have over here about it is that it's it was developed in America. So uh, Ford cars in in Europe and in in the UK in particular have a, a a reputation for outstanding handling and ride characteristics. That that's that's something that they're very respected for. Since Richard Perry Jones was here and he he brought that that uh, ethic to Ford, and uh, the his successors have been good at maintaining it so there's a lot of worry about you know oh gee it was developed by a bunch of americans what do they know about you know driving in <laughs> in the european environment so um and and we've had a lot of assurances don't worry it's going to be good even though americans <laughs> created it uh, so we're we're keeping our fingers crossed uh, about that. <laughs> well, you know, I would remind those people that the head of design for passenger cars in North America is Murray Callum, who happens to yes. hail from the UK. And if you look at you know Ford's engineering staff, I mean, it looks like the United Nations. So, yeah. I personally, I'm pleased to see that it was designed and developed in the U.S. Though I recognize that it was from people all over, because my fear was that. Ford was going to only do pickup trucks and SUVs in the U.S. and never do cars anymore and rely largely on the European operations to do all the passenger cars. So I, I was, I'm glad to see that they're mixing it up a bit. That's really good. I, I agree. Um, another, another car that um, we're going to share between the U.S. and Europe is the little Buick uh, Encore. Which is uh, which is going to be the Opel and Vauxhall, I think Mocha, a little little uh, SUV type uh, vehicle, and uh, or what is it? A small SUV? Not SUV. It's Cro more, crossover. Uh, MPV, a mini MPV. Or, I, or we even call them CUVs. Or yeah, well that yes, and I. I, I I must admit I, well, I've only seen the pictures of it, but um, I I, uh, I I think it is an encore. It's an encore of the Aztec. I think it's the Aztec of the 21st century. <laughs> uh, A lot of people don't I, like the way I, it I, looks. I can't, I can't believe the amount of contorted sheet metal that there is on this this little car. They've they've just there isn't a square inch of it that isn't 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 being tortured in some really terrible way. Uh, I I think they ought to call it the Opal Hippo when they bring it over. It's got it's a it's a really <laughs> distressing looking automobile. I I and, and nobody has said anything bad about it, but. Uh, I'm, 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 I must admit, I find it quite alarming, really. Well, they, you know, they tried to, to capture the visual appeal of the Enclave on a smaller scale, and it just doesn't work. Because uh, the, the Enclave, yeah. for, I mean, yes, it's a larger vehicle, something you don't see over there. But the Enclave is a, a quite a striking vehicle. Very good looking. Very good looking design. And... You know, they tried to uh, to shrink it down, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And I, my, my, I, I spent a lot of time with Bill Mitchell in, in the old days, and of course, Bill, Bill said, mm, you know, these small cars, it's like tailoring a dwarf. You know, he, <laughs> he, he said it's not that easy to to make it work. And, well, uh, this is this is one that, in my view, doesn't work. Well, Bill was, you know, Bill was a neighbor of ours, and I, I rode and. He gave me rides in every significant GM concept car of the uh, yeah. of the early '60s, and it, he was a piece of work. I'm sure you have some interesting stories. Oh, no. <laughs> Bill was great. I was a great, great friend and a great mentor to me. Very, very, uh, very important man in my life, Bill Mitchell. Carl, is that so where I, you? Because you yeah, uh, uh, I find that fascinating. That that was a, a part of your career that I really wasn't aware of. That. You did design work. Well, I was. I, I joined GM design staff in 1956. I worked in an experimental studio. I, I, I went in there straight from uh, Pratt Institute and uh, worked with uh, uh, Bob McLean and uh, on the team that did the Firebirds. Uh, so I, I had a little interval there, and then I went into journalism for a while. And um, and and Bill Mitchell basically hired me out of. Uh, 
uh, that that career to join uh, GM's uh, public relations staff, and I was I was Bill's PR man for, gosh, three years or three or four years, something like that. So that, that you was, know that uh, was, that was a, terrific. That was a special. Uh, Assignment, Carl. I mean, that's oh, yeah. hanging out with one of the icons of the of the business. Well, I was basically Peter hired over your dad's dead body. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they, the, the uh, PR staff had no thought of hiring a, uh, a a guy with my background at all. That wasn't on their agenda in any way, shape, or form. But Bill Mitchell just insisted on it. He said, "I want." He said, "You have a lot of guys who can mix martinis and you know talk to people and so on, but you don't have anybody who knows anything about cars. And I can't <laughs> communicate with uh, the, the with people the way I want to w without having somebody who knows about cars uh, working with me." So. Uh, people down at um, uh, West Grand Boulevard gulped and said, "Oh, okay, Bill, we'll 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 get a guy like that." <laughs> so, what years were you with Bill, Carl? It was uh, 1961 to 64. And I mean, those were some of the best years. Oh yeah, it was great. It was great. Corvette coming out, uh, Stingray, and the uh, battle with was, Zora uh, over the uh, Stingray, the split window, and all that. That's it. No, it was uh, it was fabulous, and, and and yes, I mean, in a in in a public relations position, you uh, are constantly uh, asking people in the company for help, and you're asking people for help in all throughout the company, and every time I went somewhere to uh, carry out some research or take a press guy to see something. Um, I was met with the greatest courtesy and expertise that you could possibly ask for. And in those days, GM was that kind of company. It had everywhere uh, great experts and knowledgeable people who, uh, who were able to, to, you know, spend some time uh, explaining to you what the heck they were doing. <laughs> and so that was extremely satisfying. Hey, this is probably a good time where uh, let's go to the audience, Carl, for the rapid fire segment and get some questions from them. So, Ben, let's launch rapid fire. Okay, this is where we get all the questions from the audience and try to answer them rapidly, but they don't always get answered rapidly. Brian Young wants to know, with Peugeot's departure from Le Mans, do you see any company stepping up to battle Audi? And if not, what company would, like, would you like to see battle Audi? Carl, we'll start with you. Well, it looks like Porsche is going to get back into the big time of uh, sports car racing. So, um, yes, I think, I think we, we see a, a competitor coming from Porsche at long last. They were in... Um, you know, GP2, uh, not GP2, but anyway, they're in the second rank of uh, GT2, and I think they're going up to GT1 now, so uh, we're going to see uh, uh, Porsche in there, and uh, I think for the Japanese, um, Le Mans is uh, unfinished business. I, uh, you know, we may see some, some, one of the Japanese companies uh, coming up to, the, uh, to, 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 to mount a challenge. Uh, and I, th I think Audi's going to take some time off too. So Audi will probably only field uh, private teams rather than a factory team, I would imagine. So it's going to—we'll see a little bit of a change in the uh, and and uh, quite exciting in in the uh, uh, Daytona prototypes too, with uh, Chevrolet coming in with a great-looking new uh, Corvette look-alike. Uh, Daytona prototype. So, and, and that, that's that's good news, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, Peugeot just announced they're pulling out. Toyota mm -hmm. is going to have a, an LMP car uh, at the end of this season, and I think you're right, Carl. Audi's going to step aside and go uh, go big in the GT ranks because uh, Porsche will enter the top prototype class. And so I think we'll see Toyota and Porsche battling um, and hopefully another manufacturer for the top spots in 2013 and 14. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to see Peugeot drop out. I hope they get back in. Yeah. Uh, George from Brooklyn wants to know, uh, uh, Carl, is the Porsche Cajun a good idea? 
the Porsche Cajun. Well, it may it may be a maybe a, a, a step too far in the uh, in the in the proliferation of the Porsche range. Um, uh, but but you know they will they as they did with the Cayenne they'll 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 position it in a unique way. I mean they have a way of of making a car that carves out its own special niche. And if they uh, manage that as well as they did the uh, the uh, Cayenne, then I think uh, it'll be okay. Yeah, it's a, that that that's a vehicle that they would be counting on big time to achieve the production goals that we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I I think they can do it. I think they can do it. You know, I actually think the you know, and maybe you know this, but I was told that the Porsche engineering team didn't really have enough time with the original Cayenne. And that the one, the most recent revision to it, speaks more to their input. Uh, you know, it's 450 pounds lighter. It's yeah. dynamically much better. And so I expect the uh, uh, the Cayune, as the as uh, <laughs> I was told by Porsche, is probably going to be a much more aggressive and sporty uh, crossover. So that should be interesting. Yeah, that yeah. could be pretty good. Um, let's see here. Next question. Uh, DC Auto Geek wants to know, what are your thoughts on recent reports that Ford will put up $400 million to build a prototype to build America's next military Humvee, the joint light tactical vehicle? Any thoughts? I guess I got well, some I, thoughts on this. Yeah. I, you know, uh, the Detroit automakers used to be heavily involved in the defense industry, and it, it's been a long time since they were involved there. And now the big question is, because the military is keen on this, can you take off-the-shelf mass production parts and make a military vehicle out of it? The military suppliers right now will tell you, absolutely not. They just will not stand up to battlefield conditions. But the Army's pushing this idea. I, I find it intriguing that Ford wants to get into this. And of course, uh, it's big money if you lay on the contract that goes on for many, many years. Because look at the Humvees that we're using right now. I still remember sitting in the prototype at Jeep Truck Engineering on Plymouth Road in 1980. Here it is 2012, and we're still using the vehicle that I sat in, you know, so many years ago. So anyway, I, I find it intriguing that Ford's looking at getting into this. That is that is interesting, and I I commend them for that. Uh, that that's uh, uh, you know it, it it as you rightly say also, John. It it has spinoff uh, potential. You know you could be making a, a a civilian vehicle that you you could close the loop and and bring something civilian out from the basis of what you're doing. So uh, that that looks like they uh, they have the money to do it, and uh, it's a good place to invest it. I think. Uh, it'll be fascinating to watch that. Okay, George wants to know, are there any plans for a Cadillac ATS Coupe? Yes. <laughs> there you got the answer. There's also a wagon. Ooh. Uh, well, this is good. This is good because I, I uh, in a blog, I, you know, everybody was talking about this new little Cadillac, and I said, you know, uh, it, it, it's not going to achieve the goals that the company has for it without more body styles <laughs> and uh, I hadn't heard anything uh, from the show about the body styles so Peter I'm glad to hear that that's uh, on the agenda because uh, you know they need them and they need them now they don't need them you know in 2014 they need them immediately so I hope they're uh, hope they're coming soon in the uh, lineup and Carl wouldn't you add they need a diesel engine if they want to be a serious oh. player in Europe at all Absolutely, absolutely. It's essential, no question, John. What, yeah, what's I, the, the penetration rate of diesels in the luxury segment in Europe right now? Oh, luxury segment, you're, you're you know, half, better than half. Uh, uh, diesels, I, I was so. going to say 80%. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably as high as Very that. high, 70% easily. Yeah. 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 Okay, JF from Quebec says, why is it the Chinese elite is so in love with stretched cars? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't really know. I know that's a, a big deal there, that they like to, to be driven, and that's part of their... They're in the back seat. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, if you want to make a presence, there's nothing like showing up in a big, long car than an Italy dinky little short one. So I, I think yeah. that's what it's all... It's about prestige. 
and having lots of room in the back seat. Uh, let's see, John Sarr says, when I saw the teaser pictures and then got to see the full Dodge Dart, the thing I kept saying is, if you have never seen an Alpha Giulietta, you will like the Dart. He seems to be damning the Dart with faint praise here. Uh, Carl, you, you're very familiar with the, the Giulietta, and, and you said earlier that you, you thought the Dart looked pretty good. I did, I did. I, I, I thought they'd come up with a pretty reasonable interpretation of a Dodge, uh, you know, for that class of car. But, um, you know, uh, clearly they want to differentiate um, with uh, Alpha. Um, the, the plans to bring Alfa Romeo back to the United States are still cooking away somewhere in the Fiat organization. Uh, something I hope they will only do when they are really ready to come with excellent cars. Uh, Alfa Romeo is the potential Italian BMW, but it's been a case of potential, potential, potential now for uh, many decades. And I'm, I just hope they do one day crack it because Alfa deserves to uh, have a substantial role in the world uh, motor industry. So, uh, yeah, they may have sacrificed a bit in order to maintain Alfa's distinctive look for the Giulietta, uh, not uh, to give it to Dodge. Carl, let me ask you some uh, of your tenor at GM with Bill Mitchell. What was your favorite uh, concept back then, or what was your favorite car back then from GM? Oh, the Stingray racing car. The original Stingray is oh, uh, my all-time favorite because, car. Oh, are you kidding? Yeah. Uh, I, I uh, on a number of occasions, had the chance to uh, demonstrate that car to visitors to the <laughs> uh, tech center and to, to styling staff. and. Uh, Boy, did I love, uh, you know, do, going around those roads through the tech center. You know, I had my own little circuit well, had, that, had I, that, <laughs> that I that used. Little known and, fact, uh, in the tech center, uh, they had that ride and handling loop. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't use that. I just used the roads around the tech center, yeah. <laughs> which were good enough. And, you know, past the um, uh, climate control center and then around the back. And you know, it was uh, terrific. And I remember Kenny Eschebach uh, one time. Uh, who was brilliant, the, by the way. Ken yeah, was a who, brilliant craftsman. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. When I brought the car back to the garage, he said, you really love that car, don't you? I said, I certainly do, Ken. <laughs> it's it's uh, my, was, uh, it, tremendous. Yeah, it's yeah. my all-time favorite car. Mitchell took me for a ride in it. And uh, I think the neatest thing that uh, Ed Welburn did was commission the restoration of it. And, yes. And yes, it is, that's, that's uh, right. to this day, absolutely spectacular. When it's you, dropped it beautiful. It's beautiful, and, and the size of it, people don't understand. How small it is. How small it is. And, uh, no, oh, it, yeah. The, the other car, of course, that I, that I had a chance to drive on the tech center roads was the um, Corvair Monza GT Coupe. Uh, which was a beautiful little car, as you as you recall, and I remember uh, which taking, also uh, did double duty. The front the front clip also served double duty as the nose of the Chaparral 2C. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Amen to that. And uh, I, I I remember taking Myron Scott of uh, Chevrolet PR for a ride in that car around the uh, around the Tech Center. There's a nice long, fast right hander behind the styling staff. That, right, uh, right, right. It was particularly right. good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Scotty said to me, "Oh, so this is sports carring." <laughs> I said, "Yes, sir. It certainly is." <laughs> those those two cars, Terrific the machine. the GT and silver and the SS oh. Spider were in red, in were red. stunning. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Hey, we've got a, a phone call here, Ben. Let's bring it in. Hey, John. As always, great show. Enjoy watching it every week. Uh, I've got a question for you regarding the uh, Chinese auto industry. I was wondering if there's a go-to source or any kind of uh, readily accessible source to kind of dig into the details or if you happen to know uh, the uh, financial uh, status of the Chinese auto industry in regards to the joint venture type companies like SAIC versus the smaller ones that uh, we hear that have millions and millions of units of capacity. Uh, any information that would be good to hear, I really am very curious to learn of what you think. Is the Chinese auto industry becoming a paper tiger, or is it really what uh, a lot of other people think, that it's the real deal and it's going to continue to grow 
uh, you know, for the next decade. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, great question. It's the real deal. I mean, for sure, there, there's a lot of fly-by-nights in the Chinese auto industry, but there's some real serious players. I'd highly recommend uh, that you check out Out of Line this week, our television program, but you can get it on the website. I think it'll be up tomorrow afternoon. My guest is a guy named Michael Dunn, who I consider one of the foremost experts in the world on the Chinese automotive industry. He just wrote a book called American Wheels, Chinese Roads. Anybody and everybody who has any interest in the automotive industry should read that book. It is an eye-opener. And then the only other thing that I can possibly recommend is uh, about once a month or so, J.D. Power publishes a report looking at what's going on in the Chinese industry. If you can get a hold of that, I'd recommend reading that. Carl, I don't know if you've got any uh, sources or recommendations for learning about the Chinese auto industry. I, I was going to mention Michael, uh, Michael Dunn. I know Michael. I've worked with him. And he, he's uh, consolidated his position as a real expert on the Asian industry in general. I mean, that's his, I think he's Hong Kong based. I can't remember exactly, but he is based out there and he does know the scene extremely well. Um, I don't have any other thoughts uh, on on that uh, information, you know. But it, it's it's always a tug of war between the Chinese car companies and their government. The government, at some in some phases, is willing to allow joint venture programs, and in other cases, it holds back. And so it's a it's a delicate situation. And uh, and and I guess the guys are pulling up in front of the. Uh, uh, ministry with their long wheelbase <laughs> limos uh, trying to persuade them to uh, let them do various things so uh, I, uh, but they are the real, they are the real deal no question I actually think the consumerist society is going to grow in China to the point where the government won't be able to, to stop it right I agree. good point uh, DC Auto Geek says uh, he says wasn't Callum with Jaguar Good question, because we were talking about Moray Callum, who's at Ford, and his brother Ian Callum is at Jaguar. So, uh, yeah, different, different Callum. Uh, Jim wants to know, why does Germany produce so many great automotive engineers? Well, they, uh, an, an engineer is uh, respected in Germany. You have a title, you have a degree, you, you're, you're a, a very serious uh, person, um, and they have uh, terrific uh, companies to work for in the industry that respect engineering. Engineering is an important role in, you know, BMW is basically run by engineers. Um, you, you've got organizations there that, uh, that, that greatly respect and value what an engineer can bring to the company. So it's a terrific environment for uh, an engineer to operate in. I, I think it's a combination of things, but those are two important parts. Mm -hmm. uh, another question for Carl. With all the talk of sending auto assembly back to the U.S. lately, will there ever be any mainstream production in the U.K. again? I know you still have Mini and the high-lying cars, but are there, is there ever going to be production of family-type cars? Yes, we have uh, uh, substantial production. At the moment, the uh, Nissan factory in the UK, I think it's making about 450,000 units a year. We Last year, to my surprise, I think many made uh, 285,000 uh, cars in the UK. Um, the US is the biggest market for the many, believe it or not, and uh, also Toyota and um, Honda are large producers of cars in the UK. So we're, we're doing all right in the UK as, as uh, car producers. We don't own any of these companies, uh, but, um, but, but uh, the, the UK is uh, very, doing very well in terms of car manufacture these days. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, I've always said that as long as the design, engineering, development, and manufacturing is taking place there, who cares who owns it? Well, there's much to be said for that. Uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, hey, we've got another phone call. Let's bring that in, Ben. Hey, John, Rick from San Diego. Yeah, I was wondering if you could ask Carl's thoughts on the, as far as Opal's profitability, if uh, they would make a 3 Series uh, competitor based off the ATS uh, or the Alpha pro platform, since uh, Opal will sell much higher volume cars in Europe than uh, Cadillac will. I mean, Cadillac 
may make it, but it's going to take probably about 10 years. <laughs> but Opal uh, should sell very well if it had a legitimate uh, three series player. Uh, any thoughts? Any thoughts about that, that's, Carl? A, a three series. That's competitor? a terrific idea. I mean, the the, uh, the the new Cadillac is a rear drive platform, isn't it? I mean, it that's uh, that's the USP for that, and that's uh, as I said earlier. Um, Opel and Vauxhall are hurting because they don't really have a, a senior car in there. There's no Opel diplomat or, you know, uh, no top of the range uh, uh, vehicle really. And and uh, yes, that's a. That, that could be packaged in a different way. It could be a senior car of uh, exceptional value for both Vauxhall and uh, Opel. That's an uh, interesting uh, concept uh, to, to think about doing that. Good idea. There you go, Rick. Well, hey, it's... Uh, it's I've got one more question oh, for yeah. Carl. Yeah. So, Carl, what's your top three racing cars of all time? Hmm... You can the have Alpha, six or eight, Alpha Mayo, it's okay. The Alfa Romeo uh, type 158-59, the uh, Launch uh, D50, um, and um, let's see, what's the third? Uh, I Well, the 1914 uh, Mercedes uh, that uh, swept the French Grand Prix in that year. Terrific car. Okay. Swept the French Grand Prix and then won Indy the next year, did it not? It, Amen. Very good. Well done, John. Yes, sir. <laughs> because I think Ralph De Palma <clears throat> bought one of the winning cars. Here's That's a right. story that I've been trying to track down forever. Okay. I found this in a magazine, circa, uh, uh, an old magazine. This would have been circa 1917. Ralph, De, and, and the story is Mercedes goes, wins the French Grand Prix. This is like May of 1914, literally just weeks before the war breaks out. Ralph De Palma buys one of the cars. I don't know if it was the winning car or not. No, it wasn't the winning car, but okay. anyway, yes. Puts it on one. a ship, it heads to the States, the war breaks out. Meanwhile, the War Department in the United States is saying, we need a new engine. We need an engine for our planes, we need an engine for this tank that we're working on. They were even looking at putting them in submarine chasers, PT boats of the day. So supposedly, the War Department says, we need an engine. They contract the Packard Motor Company to build it, design and build it. And so, allegedly, according to this article, Packard goes in to Ralph De Palma and says, hey, we want to borrow your race car for a while, take the engine down, copy everything, build it back up with a few tweaks of their own design, and that was the Liberty engine. And Carl, I read this and I've been trying for over a decade now to verify any of this. Nobody knows the story. John, I, I, I don't think that story holds water. Okay. The Liberty <laughs> was, uh, was developed between Hall Scott and uh, Packard. And Packard had already built some aero engines of uh, uh, quite sophisticated design. Um, and and I, when they locked themselves up in a hotel room, they, they worked with what they knew, Packard and, and Hall Scott. Uh, and and I, they didn't really have time to, to look at that. Although, you, in one respect, um, De Palma was very close to Packard. And in fact, uh, the, when, I, when he raced the Mercedes, I think it had a, a Packard adapted carburetor, for example. So he had some help from Packard. Hmm. Uh, but I think it worked that way rather than the other way around. The, the story that um, uh, goes around in the UK is that one of the cars was on display in a showroom in, uh, in London when the war broke out. And that car uh, was uh, taken up to uh, Rolls-Royce to be examined and looked at and uh, that it influenced some of the things that Rolls-Royce did. Um, I think now we're learning that was a little bit after the fact that it was an earlier six-cylinder engine that Mercedes had that, that Rolls-Royce took a look at. So we're, we're still trying to sort that one out. But there, <laughs> there is definitely a, a case of Mercedes engineering influencing Rolls-Royce in the uh, uh, creation of the Eagle V12, which was their first big serious uh, aero engine uh, for the First World War. So that's, uh, that, that, that's the way it worked. We know that there was some influence there for sure. So Carl, one last uh, question. What's your favorite all-time Porsche racing car? 
Oh boy. Well, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm a, I am a fan of the uh, 9083. You yeah. know, the uh, little car that they built for the Targa Florio and the Nurburgring, which right. Uh, right. is uh, it, it, it had fiberglass so thin you could you could see through it. <laughs> and, Not to uh, mention the driver's was, feet ahead was, of the front. We Axel. Oh yeah, you're, it, it was a hazardous little vehicle, but it uh, it it sure was a brilliant uh, piece of engineering. I I'm a big 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 fan of that uh, of that car. Yeah, that's and my I, favorite. Yeah, I'm I'm also pretty pretty keen on the uh, the Tag V6 that was developed for use by um, McLaren. And uh, my latest version of my book, Excellence Was Expected, tells the story of that engine and that cooperation, I think, in a way that isn't told anywhere else uh, in, the, uh, in the world of Porsche. So just a little plug there. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll want to read that. I definitely will. Well, Carl, we're, we're going to wrap it up, but it, it's been sensational having you on the show here. It's just really been terrific. Really enjoyed it. It's great to see you, Carl. And, Thanks a lot. Peter. And, Thanks, and you've John. motivated me. I, I got to come back in here this weekend and start going through my files and dig up that old story about, you know, possibly uh, Packard looking at uh, the Mercedes Grand Prix engine. Okay. <laughs> but, Carl, what a pleasure. It, it's, it's been terrific. Just terrific. Thanks for asking me. That's great. Well, Peter, it's been great having you here, too. No, it, was, it was a really good show. Really good show. So, folks, we're going to wrap it up here. Remember, you can always find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Autoline Detroit. You can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash Autoline. Same with Peter's stuff. Go to twitter.com slash Auto Extremist, or better yet, just go to autoextremist.com. Uh, you can always subscribe to all of our things for free on our website. Check it out. Don't forget that tomorrow... There's going to be Roundabout starting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we're going to be off next week because I'm going to the, the D.C. Auto Show. In fact, next Thursday during the day, we'll be webcasting live from the D.C. Show. We've got some pretty high-level politicians and regulators and other industry people. You might want to check that out. But Oh, yeah, and if you've got any questions that you want to have us asking at that auto show, Make sure that you send them now. Ben just weighed in on that to, and send it to John's journal, right, as I keep repeating what Ben's telling me to say <laughs> here. But uh, anyway, folks, uh, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. And uh, good night or good morning, Simon, wherever you are. Wherever you are. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. And by Chevrolet, Chevy runs deep. Well, Carl, now we'll, we'll cut you free and you can go to sleep because okay. it's way <laughs> past my bedtime where you are. Yeah, it's, it's just great. I really enjoyed it, gentlemen. Great fun to talk cars with you guys and with your audience. Thanks a lot for asking me. And, you know, if you, if you get over here to Detroit, let us know. And uh, you yeah. know, we'd love yeah, to have you. I sure you. will. And, uh, and we'll do this again at some point in the future. Lovely. Okay. Thanks a lot. Take okay. care, Carl. Take care. Take care. Good yeah. night. Good night. God, what a great being guy. Mitchell's okay. personal PR guy for three years at the heyday of General Motors has to be just fabulous. Well, not only that, but uh, leaving and getting hired back yeah. and going over your dad's head to make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I remember my dad talking about Mitz. I mean, he was our neighbor. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, I think my dad, like, looked the other way a lot of times yeah, because, yeah. you know, Mitchell raised holy hell with the financial types. And, you know, back then, of course, we've talked the divisional general managers were, like, uh, heads of small countries, and they had complete control, design, manufacturing, sales, Everything, everything, all contained. Everything. And it was a brilliant thing when GM was running on all cylinders. It, right. it was just a, a wonder to behold. But uh, if Mitchell, if a divisional general manager came in all, you know, with his dander up ready to go to war with Mitchell, it usually didn't go very well for them. <laughs> right. He'd just, just say, you know what, that's it. Right.
And, and I think this made a critical difference. Mitchell reported directly to the chairman. Yeah. I mean, directly to the chairman. So that's how he had the power. Well, that the had. finance types, you know, they could only squawk so much because Mitchell was brilliant at bringing show car styling to the masses. Right. That's his, to me, his greatest contribution, besides the fact of having these brilliant designers at his disposal like Larry Shinoda and, right. these, and you know Peter Brock and Tony Lapine and all these guys who worked you know around and they produced the original Stingray and just fabulous yeah, stuff. No. God, what an era. Yeah. What an era. Ben, thank you. As always. Good night, Mark, wherever you are. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what should we call this show? <laughs>